Thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, thank you for coming to the show. Um, okay, so I have I introduced you as and I have already told that you are a um, award-winning portrait photographer. So now can you please, um, you know, can you tell something about yourself as in your journey? How did you end up becoming a portrait photographer? What did you do in your early life? And how did all that happen? Yeah. Uh, originally, I had a very different view of my life or where I was going to go. I started off studying finance uh, straight out of secondary school or high school. And I worked in an office. I went all the way to America to study finance from Ireland. And um, it didn't really suit me. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the journey that I had or the work I was doing. And when I went then to, when I came back to Ireland, I worked in pubs, I worked in bars and restaurants and uh, nightclubs. And I just found that I had more enjoyment of working with people because it was, it was a happier experience, I suppose, for work. Um, then I trained in emergency medicine, so pre-hospital medicine. Um, that was another part of my journey. And I had an interest in people always. So okay. once the photography started, the photography started as a hobby because I suppose every photographer out there will start off as a hobby photographer. And when I started to take photographs, I was actually terrified to photograph people because every time I did, they told me they looked fat or old or ugly and they didn't like themselves in the photographs. And I felt like that was my responsibility or my fault for causing that pain or causing that discomfort. So I just wouldn't take pictures of people. Um, it kind of transitioned as I started to take photographs at weddings and I started to photograph uh, fashion work. And as I grew, um, I knew I wanted more and more to photograph people. And then in 2014, I got the chance to train with a guy named Peter Hurley. Uh, Peter's the top headshot photographer in the whole world. I think he was listed as one of the top 10 living photographers, the most influential photographers alive. Um, and I think 16th photographer, the, the 16th most influential photographer to ever have lived. Um, so I was very lucky to train with him in 2014. And mm -hmm. since I trained with him, everything has changed. My focus is not really on the faces anymore. It's more what goes on on the inside of the person and how they wear that on the outside. Uh, that's why my kind of logo says substance over superficial. And that's why I focus on the, the kind of science behind humans and how we interact with each other. And I put that into my photography. So yeah, it's, it's been a long journey, um, but it's been a very rewarding journey so far. And you know, it, it continues to be rewarding every single day. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it will be. And um, I mean, uh, you know, the thing that you told about photography that you actually um, look into people's, you know, look inside what actually goes inside people rather than, you know, outside the facial beauty or the outside beauty. So, um, you know, I would like to ask more about uh, that part. But before that, I actually would like to know more about what exactly is portrait photography, as in you are a portrait photographer. And how is it different from other photographies? Yeah, so I would like to know about that too. Yeah, portrait photography is anything where you're taking photographs of people. It can be anything from fine art photography where you're photographing people to headshots because I stand six feet in front of my clients. Um, so I'm in a very, very confined space. I shoot from the collarbones up to the tops of their head where okay. sometimes I do take photographs of their full bodies. I take photographs of their legs, you know, anything like fashion photography where you're photographing people, um, portrait photography, where you're trying to get an essence of the person in the photograph. So that's really where portrait photography lives. And that's, that's what it is. I suppose what, the difference between portrait photography and many other forms of photography is, is the fact that you're dealing with humans and you need to understand that when you're photographing one person, um, or maybe two people or three people together, you need to have a connection with those people. It's not like sports photography where there's no real emotion in sports photography other than the fact that they may be winning or losing. What you're doing is you're taking photographs of people on a field. You're not really connected to the person. Whereas portrait photography, the person is, is connected to the photographer and the photographer should be connected to the person. Okay, okay. And would you say that photography is something that is, you know, um, God gifted or uh, is it a talent that you, you yourself have to work upon? Um, some people have a very photographic eye. So some people are, are visual learners or they're visually experienced. So 
as they experience the world, they do it based on how they see it. They do it, they see things and appreciate these things based on looking at them. So some people are naturally able to frame photographs better. They're able to pick out pictures better. Um, where photography itself is a science, like it's a science of light and all it is is light, you know, because even in here, if I was to turn off this light, you know, I'd be very dark because we've got loads of lights behind us. So it's a science of understanding the balance between light and the relationship that has to the camera and how the camera picks it up. Um, anybody can learn photography. You don't have to be naturally gifted towards it. You don't have to be, you can take photographs of anything, apples, cars, you know, anything you're interested in, you can take photographs of and be a great photographer taking photographs of it. It just takes experience and practice. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a merge of both. It's, it's definitely a mix of both. Okay, okay, got it. Um, so, and also, you know, some people are, you know, naturally photogenic and some people, you know, when somebody clicks them. So, you know, they naturally have that face that come beautiful in the camera and beautiful in photos. But um, whereas some people are not that, I mean, you know, when uh, the photos come, so they are not as uh, beautiful as they are in person. So, um, how, how, you know, what is the work of a photographer in that area? I don't believe that nobody's photogenic. I don't believe that some people are more photogenic than others. There's beauty in every single face on the planet. There's seven and a half billion people on earth. Every face is different and every face is supposed to be different. My face is different than yours and yours is different than the next person. That's the beauty within my face is different than the beauty that's within your face. So even though people believe sometimes that they're not photogenic, they are. When I trained with Peter Hurley, he showed me a picture of this lady. Her name is Umpele Kenagobe. And he said, what do you think of her? She, and I said, she's beautiful. Um, he said, when she photographed, or when he photographed her, he showed her the pictures on a screen and she said she hates her face. She was Miss Universe when the picture was taken. So every single person on the planet has insecurities when they see themselves, especially in photographs, because we believe we look like a person in the mirror, but we don't because it's back to front. So when you see a photograph of yourself, your brain says, what's wrong with that? Why do I not look like me? And you pick one thing on your face you don't like. It's the same thing in every single photograph, and it's always there. And you blame that on making you feel uncomfortable. But actually what's wrong is the person in the photograph is uncomfortable. And cells in your brain called mirror receptors are making you copy what you see. So if you meet somebody who's happy, you're happy. If you meet somebody who's sad, you're sad. And if you meet somebody who's uncomfortable, you copy, you mimic what you see. So if they're uncomfortable, then you feel uncomfortable because you need to figure out why. And then you blame that one thing on your face you don't like. And you say, oh, it's my nose or it's my ears or it's my eyes. I don't like it. You know, I don't have, I'm not as pretty as everybody else. Comparison is the mother of all evil and it's the thief of joy. So when you compare yourself to any model or any supermodel or anybody who's selling watches in an advert, you know, you're only taking away the joy of the experience of what you look like. Your friends and family think you're beautiful. Everybody thinks you're beautiful except you. So that's one of the things that we do in here. I look at the substance of what's going on inside people and I teach them about how they normally move how they normally interact, how they normally react to people and what they look like. Because you've got 16,384 different musculature variations in your face. There's no way that you know what you look like. You just believe you look a certain way. And my job is then to teach people that they don't look like that. And the job of every photographer should be to teach people that you're more beautiful than you think you are. And we're going to take away the insecurities and we're going to take away the things that make you feel uncomfortable. And I'm going to prove to you that you're better looking than you think you are. And that's what I do in here every single day. That's what I do for my multinational clients. That's what I do for individuals. That's what I do with people with craniofacial prosthesis. I work with kids with cancer. I work with them all and I teach them that they're better looking than they think they are. They're more beautiful and they're perfect as they are. Okay, that's beautiful. I mean, that's great. And so what exactly do you say or what exactly is your instruction? You know, you actually, um, while you were talking about photography, portrait photography, so you said that uh, it's above this, uh, it's basically the headshot. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you uh, you mentioned this thing that uh, mostly people are, you know, insecure of them getting photographed because of their insecurities or their looks or different things. So what exactly is your in instruction to them? So to not to be insecure and just to be happy in photos. So what do you exactly say? The worst thing in the world you can do is give them instructions. If I tell somebody to smile, they smile with their mouth because 
their brain believes that when we're happy, we're genuinely happy and we respond to something that makes us happy. Yeah. That is a hormone release. So from the tips of your toes to the top of your head, you're happy. So all of your body moves because you're happy. Everything goes upwards and everything goes outwards. But when people stand in front of my camera, they're un uncomfortable, they're insecure, they're full of uh, stress hormones, fight or flight reaction hormones. Mm -hmm. But we need to get rid of those. And if I give them instructions and say, smile, they're gonna move their mouth like this. <laughs> That's True. not a smile, it's fake. Because their brain is saying, smile is mouth, I need to move my mouth. But the rest of their body is saying, I'm uncomfortable. So, and that's true hormone signatures. So it's not happening based on that this smile, this fake smile isn't good. So I don't say smile. I never give them instructions. I tell them to do things with their body or I teach them to move their body the way that they moved their body before they got in front of the camera. So I look at them to understand whether they favor the left side of their face or the right side of their face when they're comfortable. Do they tip their head to the left or to the right? What way are they normally? And then I teach them to replicate the things that they do because they can't see themselves. When they stand in front of the camera, they can't make sure that they're in the proper position. They can't make sure that their posture is big or that they look confident. You know, I can't have to make sure that they see their jawline because when we're stressed, we back away. And then people say, I don't like my face because I'm fat. I have all of this stuff going on. But when we bring our heads forward, it means that we can actually see the shape of the jaw. Um, so lots of different things, lots of the micro adjustments to teach them to see themselves on camera the way they actually look to everybody else but i don't give them instructions if you give them instructions they get lost and they end up lost in their own head and stressed um, or doing silly fake smiles and that's just not it never say smile to anybody who you're taking photographs of if you want them to smile make them laugh Okay, I mean, uh, now now I get the point that whenever somebody says smile or whenever, we, whenever somebody clicks a photo and they say, uh, you know, look into the camera. So why uh, why do we suddenly become all uh, so conscious? Um, so uh, from the next time, if I'm clicking somebody's photos, so I'm never going to instruct them. Okay, so I've learned this, this thing yeah. from you now. That's why people like photographs, candid photographs, where they didn't know the, the picture was being taken. We don't see that one thing on our face we don't like or that thing that makes us feel uncomfortable in that photograph because we genuinely experience or we trust the expression we see. So, you know, if you go to a party and this, girls do it all the time, you know, you go to a party and two girls don't like each other, but they smile anyway. And they're this kind of fake, horrible yeah. smile. Um, and they do that to each other. But they both know that it's a fake smile. They both know it's an uncomfortable smile. So they both feel uncomfortable about that experience. But that's the same as when you see yourself in a photograph doing that same smile. You feel that person should be smiling at me with a genuine smile, but they're not. So then you compare yourself to everybody else and you pick that thing on your face you don't like, or the fact that you may, be, you, you may think you're overweight or you don't like your hair or there's something that you don't like. And you blame that on making you feel uncomfortable. But when you see photographs where you didn't know the photographer was taking the picture and you've got a genuine expression on your face, that one thing that you don't like doesn't exist anymore you like that photograph and you will hold on to that photograph and you'll use that photograph on Facebook or on Twitter or on your Instagram or it goes on all these feeds because you really like that experience of how you felt looking at that picture because the expression is genuine and reactive. Um, so yeah, don't give people instructions. If you want to make them laugh or you want them to smile, make them laugh. Um, and that's an easy thing to do. I mean, I think uh, that is the reason why hashtag candid is so popular in photography these days. I mean, yeah. whether you, yeah, whether you post a photo on Facebook, Instagram, or wherever, so you know this. Uh, um, if that photo is candid, so it looks more beautiful comparatively. Okay. Yeah, well, that's it. You're you're seeing somebody genuinely in full flow of themselves. That you're seeing the personality rather than seeing a photograph that vaguely resembles them, uh, with no life or no personality going on. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, so moving on to my next question. So now that you chose to be a photographer, because you know, um, photography is an unconventional um, career to choose. I mean, uh, an unconventional path in, you know, uh, when we think of becoming something, people normally go for, you know, jobs and all these things, because uh, they have the fixed salary, they have uh, a fixed, um, you know, uh, nine to five jobs and all that. So when you chose to be a photographer, so what kind of challenges did you face? Did you actually went through challenges or it, it came easy? Um, at the start, I didn't know what to do. I, I thought maybe I could be a stock photographer so I could go out and take photographs of lots of stuff. 
sell it on iStock Photo or one of these websites and let them kind of pay me back for the, the, the use of the images. Um, I wanted to be a, a portrait photographer. I wanted to be a wedding photographer. I wanted to be a fashion photographer. I kind of tried everything. I tried photographing families with kids and pets and all of that sort of stuff didn't interest me really. It, I was very focused on the money aspect because the business needs to pay, you know, I need to pay the bills. I need to pay the rent for the studio. I need to pay myself. And I was worried about all of that sort of stuff. But then when I realized that I want to shoot headshots, I want to shoot headshots to teach people to, to see the beauty inside them. I want to make people feel better about themselves. I want to help them coach and through self image issues. I want to do that because I'm interested in the people and because I have a social responsibility to do that. And then the rest wasn't the problem anymore. I stopped photographing fashion jobs. I stopped photographing pretty much everything else. And I solely focused on headshots because six feet in front of people, I can teach them that they're more beautiful than they think they are. Um, especially using my kind of uh, psychological background and my medical background um, and using my knowledge to teach people and coach them properly. So since then, I haven't faced any problems. Um, I don't have any problems within my business. I work three days a week. Uh, the rest of the time, I do things like I learn new languages, like I'm trying to learn Chinese at the moment. Um, I speak Italian. So I'm mixing all of the different uh, things that interest me, I get to do. Today, I'm going camping after I'm done on this interview. I'm going kayak camping with my friends. I have plenty of time off to enjoy myself and enjoy my life because I own my, I, I own my business. I own my time. I decide whether I work two days a week, three days a week, or five days a week. So as long as my bills are paid, I'm happy and I'm not focused on the stress that money tends to bring. And that's one of the things that photographers need to let go of. I think people in all sorts of businesses need to let go of that because when you're focused on money issues or you're focused on problems, well, then you're not able to focus on the positive things that happen within your life and within your business. Uh, you miss way too many opportunities by being focused on negatives and focused on stress. So let it go. Go and do things that make you feel happier and more fulfilled. Um, and if you can do that through your business as well or through what you do within your studio or it doesn't matter whether you're a photographer or anything else, if you're able to enjoy it, well, then the experience is better for you. Then it's, it's better for your clients because when my clients come in here, because I'm happy, because I'm happy within my life, they get a happier experience of me and they like me more. They like to be in here more, um, which means that they'll always come back and they just, I just have a better experience and they have a bit better experience, which makes everybody happier. And, um, but yeah, the, the, I don't really have any problems within my business at the moment. So pretty, I don't have any. I mean, um, that's great. That's uh, amazing. If you are happy doing what you do. So that's the most beautiful thing. Uh, you know, and also uh, now moving on to my next question. So now that, uh, you know, today's youth, if I talk about, so they have, um, it, even though they have so much passion in them of becoming something, of becoming an artist or some something that they want to do in life, but because of, you know, uh, financial problems and something or something other, they tend to uh, go for other jobs and they tend to go for something else that would help them monetary uh, financially or um so all these things. So what would you suggest them to do and not leave their passion for all the jobs and all the, uh, you know, all that they do? So what would you suggest then? That's only imposter syndrome. That's that sense of I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not cool enough. I don't have the network. Okay. Yeah. Just they need to go and do it, whether they have to work a full time job until they get the experience and they get the confidence to run their business and to be a photographer solely. Um, you know, they need to be taking photographs. The more photographs you take, the better you get. The more you learn, the better you get. So they need to be focused on that while they're still doing their jobs. I worked a full time job and I had to move my business as well on the side. So I was working at times 100 hours a week. So 100 hours a week is a lot to work especially between two different jobs and two different, very different mindsets. Um, but, you know, the, the whole thing is to understand where your belief is and your passion is, and, but understand where your business needs to go. So if you want to be a portrait photographer or you want to be a headshot photographer, you need to learn as a headshot photographer and focus your attentions on that. Um, stop photographing weddings and parties and, you know, kids and pets and 
anything else in the phase. You need to focus solely on what you want your business to be. Um, and you need to have the belief that you can get there. If you don't get there, you can always go back to your other job. You know, you can you can leave and go back, you can just get a new job. Um, but having the belief that the business can succeed and having the belief in yourself is more important than anything else. So you really need to focus on what it is that you want to do and just do that. Um, I didn't want to photograph weddings anymore. I didn't want to photograph fashion anymore. I didn't want to photograph parties. I didn't want to photograph any of that stuff. And my interest is the people who walk into this studio or the people I go and I travel to work with. Um, the talks that I give, the, you know, about self-image and self-acceptance. And you know, that's where I wanted to focus my business. And that's where I wanted to focus my attention because it's what I'm interested in. So I did it. And it works. You know, if you believe in what you have to say uh, and the, the message that you have to give within your photography or from your own vocal voice, well, then, you know, people will listen to it, especially if you're passionate about it. If you want to be a fine art photographer, you want to photograph artistic nudes, you want to photograph whatever it is you want to photograph, you need to believe that you can do it and go and do it. Um, and then eventually, when you're comfortable enough, you can leave your full time job. Okay, amazing. Um, I hope uh, the audience is whoever is watching this program and whoever is watching this show, um, you know, um, has got some help and has got some tip um, from you as in what to do in their life and how to not, um, you know, quit their dreams and their passion. Okay. So moving on to the next question. So uh, now that uh, since you are a very, uh, you know, award winning photographer, you're a very successful photographer and also um, the person whom you have learned from your, uh, you know, your te I, I can call him your teacher. Uh, so who is actually uh, one of the world's uh, best, who's one of the world's best photographer you have said, uh, mentioned. So, um, I would ask you that what did you learn from him and also according to you, what does it need to be a good photographer? Yeah. Um, what I learned from Peter was that, you know, it's not just the people that I photograph in the studio here or the people that I meet that have insecurities. It was people like Miss Universe. It was people who are international superstars and models and, and actors that have insecurities about how they look. And, you know, I learned that really quickly and I learned not to not to discount their insecurities, not to just go, ah, sure, it's okay. Like everybody's supposed to feel insecure looking at themselves. You know, if you don't, you're vain. That sort of stuff doesn't work. He, he taught me to teach people. So teach them everything. Teach them about what happens when they change their posture. Teach them what happens when they change their facial expressions. Teach them what happens when they move in different directions. And show them the images on the screen. And every single time you take photographs of them, show them how that changes who they are and how it changes their personality and how it shows different aspects of their personalities. So I learned a lot of that from them. I learned a lot about lighting. I learned a lot about, you know, how to, to best get my lights to, to frame a person's face or to show the different angles of the person's face or the different characters, characteristics of somebody's face and their personality by using light. Um, and that was one of the big lessons that I learned from him. I learned to be humble as well, because when I'd show him my images, I'd think the images were really, really great. I'd be really happy with the images I'd supplied for, to clients. And he would give me, tell me, that's not good. You know, your light's bad. Your light transitions are bad. How the shadows fall are bad. You need to do this. You need to change what you're doing there. You need to change the coloring. You need to understand there needs to be consistency. And he taught me to be consistent. He taught me to be more in control, uh, to especially be more in control of what happens when I'm talking to clients in here, um, how they're experiencing me, how they're experiencing the environment. He taught me a lot, a, a huge amount. And... You know, what it means to be a great photographer is I remember training with a guy or I met a guy, um, a, a photographer named Clive Booth, one of the best fashion photographers in the world, one of the best portrait photographers in the world. And he spoke, we were having dinner and he was talking about the relationships that people have to photography. So if you're in a camera club as an amateur photographer and you're surrounded by other amateur photographers, they all tend to talk about equipment, having the best camera gear, having the best lenses, having the best lights, you know, what the equipment means and what the value is in the equipment. But once people turn into professional photographers, they tend to focus a lot on the money aspect of the business. 
where they're getting paid from, how much money needs to go into the business, how they need to draw clients to themselves. And they're very focused on money and they complain mm. a lot about money. But if you meet master photographers, people who are great, people who are fantastic at what they do, they don't talk about gear and they don't talk about lights and they don't talk about money and they don't talk about the business aspect of what they do. Their main passion is light and how light falls across the face or how they interact with the things that they have naturally to them. So if they have you know, sunlight or they have artificial lights in a studio, they're more interested in how that feels when it looks, when you look at the image rather than focusing on money or focusing on equipment. So to be a great photographer, you need to be interested in what it is you're photographing. You know, you need to have passion for it. If you're a Formula One car racing fan, you need to be photographing Formula One racing cars. You know, if you're interested in cars, you need to be photographing cars. If you're interested in, if you're interested in apples, you need to be photographing apples. You know, if you're interested in street life, if you're interested in, in what goes on on the streets and how people interact with each other, out in public well then maybe you should be a street photographer and that's what you be focused on you should not be if you're an introvert you don't like talking to people you're not really comfortable talking to people or coaching people then you shouldn't be a portrait photographer you know you should be photographing pe the things in life that interest you most um whether that's you know animals whether it's sports whether it's cars whether it's people you know you focus on the thing that makes you happy and the thing that makes you happy is the thing you're most interested in and that makes a great photographer because you'll always always find the best in the thing that you're looking at or the thing that you're interested in you know the same i'm not i like cars but i'm not a big car enthusiast i wouldn't be a, a kind of i wouldn't be interested in car photography I could go out and take photographs of cars, technically great photographs of cars, but I wouldn't have any interest in it. And it wouldn't be long before I got fed up doing it. I just didn't want to do it anymore because I'm not interested in it. And that's where you lose the passion for it. So if you're photographing the wrong things, you're going to lose the passion in photography. Uh, but if you photograph things that really interest you, then you'll have to, the passion will be there. And not only, not only will the passion be there, the photographs will be much better. And people will get your passion from what you do. Okay, so you are suggesting here that one should look for their passion and one should uh, actually look for um, their interest and they should know um, their focus, where the focus is. So you're suggesting that, that they should know what they want to do in life rather than, you know. So what about the people who want to explore? Because, you know, uh, once we don't explore, we don't actually know that where our interest lies. So what, what about that? Photograph everything, like absolutely everything. That's the thing is like when you're starting as a photographer, take photographs of everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Take photographs of absolutely everything. Any, anywhere you find light that's interesting, anytime you find something that you think is cool, take pictures of it. Take lots of pictures of it and take pictures of it again in a year's time and two years time because maybe your skills will be upgraded since then. So you should be able to take better uh, photographs when you're two or three years as a photographer or three or four or five years as a photographer, take photographs of the same things again. Um, but the thing is to take photographs of absolutely everything. It doesn't matter what it is. And if it interests you, take photographs of it. And the more and more and more you do it, the more you're going to find yourself drifting towards a certain area because that's what interests you fundamentally. And that's what you want to be a photographer in. If you want to be a press photographer, you want to photograph celebrities, you go and do it. You know, go and photograph people until you build up the skills and then start photographing celebrities. Find out where they're staying in their hotels. If you want to be a paparazzi photographer, learn from other photographers who are doing the same thing. Figure out what skills you need because every element of photography is very different. You know, if you photograph people, you want to be doing it a certain way. If you want to photograph fashion, you need to do it a different way. You need to understand about lengths of lenses. You need to understand light. But you need to learn about that. And you need to learn how that interacts with, I suppose, your belief systems in, in yourself and in, in what you want to do. So it's all about taking photographs of absolutely everything and finding what interests you the most. And then you can focus on that. But you need to learn how that works. But by photographing people first and by photographing pets and animals and wildlife and birds and nature and anything else that you can take photographs of but fundamentally if you do that you will find what you want to be interested in or what you are interested in 
and what's going to draw your attention the most. And that's the thing then that you focus on. And that's the thing that you spend your time working at. That's a great tip. I mean, um, that's a great tip to give. And uh, I hope people are listening. And I hope that people, the ones who want to be a photographer, are watching this episode and they are getting things to learn. Okay. So now um, to my other question. So you also have, you know, when I actually went to a LinkedIn profile, I actually saw a line over there that you actually wrote that I traveled the world to teach people to uncondition unconditionally love their faces. So uh, this was, uh, I think this was a uh, line that you wrote. So it actually, uh, you know, um, drove my attention to it. So, uh, you know, because you travel the world, you meet different, different people. You know, not every person is same. Like you said, that there are so many people and every face is different. And uh, so is the behavior. So is the attitude. So how do you actually deal with them? And how do you actually tell so many different people with so many different attitudes and personalities and faces? How do you tell them? to love themselves unconditionally. How do we do that? Evidence-based. Um, I take photographs of them and I prove to them that they look different than they think they do. Because you think you look like the person in the mirror and you don't. You know, every single person on the planet thinks they look like the person in the mirror. But for 90 million years, we've had eyeballs. And for 90 million years, we've, understand, we've understood based on shape. So people are shapes, numbers are shapes, words are shapes. Everything is a shape. And humans understand shapes. We process maybe 2 million pieces of information every minute based like everything from the temperature of your toes, like all the way up to things that are actively within our, our vision and things that we're seeing and we're experiencing. So we discard most of that information and we discard things like the fact that the mirror is, is wrong. The mirror is back to front for, we're not supposed to be able to see ourselves, but 180 uh, years ago, the mirror was invented so that we could see ourselves. And it's the wrong way around. So for 180 years, we believed that we look like the person in that mirror, but we don't. Everybody else in the world sees something different. So every single person that I photograph, I show them, I use this lens, is very, very similar to the focal length or the distance that the human eye sees. Um, and then it's connected to a computer. So when I take photographs, they come up live on my computer screen or a big TV screen beside me. So I show the people what happens when they move certain ways. And I teach them that what you see in the mirror is wrong. You know, the, when you see photographs of yourself, your brain is trying to figure out what's wrong. Why do I not look like the person in the mirror? And your brain should say it's back to front. It's just the wrong way around. That's what's wrong. But it doesn't. Your brain needs to seek out a reason that you look different. So what it does is it looks on your face and it looks for one thing you don't like. It's the same thing in every photograph. It's always there. And you blame that on making you feel uncomfortable. Like I said earlier, it's actually your facial expression that's wrong. So when we take away that one thing on their face, when I show them, when they move their face a certain way, when they move genuinely and they don't pull fake expressions, well, then you're actually more beautiful than you think you are. And then we work through many, many different ver versions or variations of their posture of their expressions, um, and we use that with science. So using cognitive behavioral therapy, using elements of psychology, using elements of neuro-linguistic programming, we use those together then to teach people what they actually look like and how to move when they're standing in front of the camera, um, and to teach them that you're not any different than anybody else. Under these lights in this studio, they're under the same conditions as superstars in Hollywood. You know, when you see all these photographs of actors and models, those photographs have been taken and sent to a uh, retoucher that uh, if somebody to edit or Photoshop those images to make their skin better. You know, so it's not only that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens to those images once they're sent away. But standing under the same lights as actors and models, everybody's just as beautiful as, as the actors and models are. They're just completely different. Every face is different. Every personality is different. So you get to show them live as with evidence, without any. Um, any filters, there's no change in the images, they come up on the screen as they are, and we teach people that this is what you actually look like. Not only that, we can go back to the start of the session where we've taken a photograph, where the person does that thing that they do every time they have their photograph taken, and they look uncomfortable. So as we see the images, we transition through the images, you can see the growth and the change in the person's uh, confidence in how they, they kind of perceive themselves. And you can see them, even though they've come out maybe five, six, seven times to look at the images. And we've, through the coaching session itself, 
even though we go back to the first image, you can see their growth and they can see their own growth and their change uh, personality wise and their, their change. I don't know, even beauty in their face changes because they get to see themselves and they get more confident looking at themselves and they're desensitized to that first image. So near the end, what we do again is we'll show the first image and we'll show an image some way through the session and we'll say, look, this is what you think you look like, which is the uncomfortable first image. And this is what you actually look like to everybody else. So the difference between the first image and an image through the session shows them that they're more beautiful than they think they are. So the evidence is real. Um, and they get to see that the evidence that they had before that first image or what they, they believed they looked like was always wrong. Um, so under the right conditions, when they're taught and they're, exp and, and they're coached uh, to see themselves, then they get to see what everybody else sees, what their families love, what their friends love, what their husbands or their wives love and their kids love. Uh, they get to see that person and that actual human rather than an uncomfortable version of themselves that they don't like. I mean, if you know uh, all that that you have said, I mean, if uh, everyone had the same view, viewpoint and everyone had the same eyes to look at people um, in the same manner as you do, so there would be no racism problem, there would be no, uh, you know, no differentiation and no problem, and there would be all love in the world. And but uh, but yeah, I mean, photography teaches uh, us a lot, a lot, and um, you have mentioned um, great points and. Uh, amazing things also now you know can you also tell our audiences about your awards i mean you're an award-winning photographer but can you also tell uh, something about your awards all the awards that you have won yeah i've picked up awards all over the place over the years anything from fashion awards to like you know to even being featured on on the covers of magazines and stuff like that um in 2008 i took a photograph of um oh sorry 2013 the on the shortest day of the year um, I took a photograph at a wedding of an old man with a hat on. Um, that image was blasted around the world. It was on the covers of magazines all over the, all over the world. I was an ambassador for Canon at the time. Do you have it on your phone or somewhere? Can we see that? Um, I have him here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that image was taken at the on the shortest day of the year in 2013. Um, and when I took that image, it was at a wedding, um, and they didn't really want any photographs of the speeches, or they didn't want any photographs of the ceremony. They didn't, it was a bit of a strange wedding, but it was really cool. So myself and the guy I was shooting the wedding with, we decided we'd photograph all of the guests individually. Uh, he used a soft box, which was huge. It was maybe seven feet wide. Uh, like two and a half meters wide to photograph all the women under really, really glowy, soft, beautiful light. I used something called a beauty dish, which is the size of a dinner plate. And I had it really, really close to the men's faces. So the light source was really, really contrasty and it was really strong. And he was one of the people I photographed. I knew the image was special. So I sent it off to one of the guys in Canon and said, here, what do you think of this? Uh, just to get some feedback on the image. But I woke up the next day and I had emails from Gamma Magazine, F Stoppers, just Canon. It was on Canon USA, Canon Global, Canon Asia. It was on Canon Europe. Uh, it was on Canon Africa. It was on, it was everywhere. It was absolutely everywhere. By, the, by Christmas Day, it was featured on lots of uh, online magazines and it was featured on lots of websites by Christmas Day. Um, I was awarded Portrait Photographer of the Year that year. Uh, by Strawbox Magazine, by Gamut Magazine. Um, that was Portrait of the Year for both of them as well. Um, it was in an article from on F Stoppers, which is like the Forbes magazine for photographers. Um, it was on Headshot Crew. It was all over all the Canon websites. I just picked up awards all over the place for that. I picked up awards for other stuff as well. So, I, I, you know, again, I've been on uh, featured in the likes of Gamma Magazine and, and these things many, many, many times. I've been on lists. So at the moment, I'm on three lists as one of the top 100 headshot photographers in the world. Um, and that's really rewarding. You know, it's, it's it's nice to be kind of viewed by my peers as, as somebody who's doing something different uh, or who's bringing things to the next level, um, especially considering I'm the only person who's actually mixing human behavioral sciences with photography. So and also, so did you expect it to be so big? The image? No, I just, 
was showing one of the guys what I'd done. You know, I was like, here, I saw, I took this image. It's really cool. I think you should see it. And it blew up. Um, it, it was the reason that actually I ended up training with Peter Hurley. So um, that had kind of led down, me down that pathway. And it kind of changed how I do things, how I photograph people, how I view people um, in front of my lens. And I knew taking that image that I wanted to spend the rest of my career standing maybe six feet in front of people to try and match their personalities more than just vague images that look like them. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I wasn't expecting it to do anything. It was just a cool image. Um, but everybody saw the value in the image, which, and they, they saw something great in the image. They saw the guy's personality and there is the life within him. Um, and that was it. You know, it, it took me to kind of crazy new places very, very quickly. So um, I spent the last what, seven years uh, learning and, and trying to improve my craft based on the skills that I had back then um, and based on the skills that I picked up from Peter Burley and people like that. So it's, uh, the last six years and seven years have been incredible. Amazing. I mean, that's that's beautiful. And um you know, it actually um, changed your journey overnight. You actually um, took a photo and then it, you know, became so big. So it actually changed your journey and changed you um, overnight. So, I mean, that's beautiful. And uh, many, many congratulations to you for all that, for achieving all that. And so now um, you are also working on Project Perfect. So yeah, yeah. So I have a couple of projects on at the moment. Um, one is Project Perfect. The other is the Doyle Faces campaign. Um, the Doyle Faces campaign is uh, is a company in the UK called Doyle Global. It's it stands for Diverse Inclusive Aspirational Leaders. That's what Doyle stands for. Um, and one of the things that Doyle are doing are trying to recognise and celebrate the differences in diversity and inclusion. But not only diversity and inclusion, the people who are change makers in diversity and inclusion. So this year, the idea was to photograph two thousand and twenty people um, who are leaders within the the diversity, inclusion, and belonging space, and to then show the images an art show in the Ritz in London um, in December. But because of COVID, everything's changed. So I needed to rejig things, and I just wanted to do something that was interesting to me. And the people who don't come forward to have their photographs taken are people with things like scars, people with facial birthmarks, people with Down syndrome, people with um, facial palsy. So they might have... Uh, you know, one side of their face has a droop. They might have uh, different things going on within their life that they wear um, on their skin. So they're, they're really the people who don't put forward to have photographs taken or shy away. And I don't believe that they're, they're any less beautiful than anybody else. So one of the things I wanted to do was to put Project Perfect together to celebrate the differences in people's faces, to show people that they're more beautiful they think they are even though they might have facial palsy or they might have a birthmark or they might have you know they might have scars or, or acid burns or something so yeah so i've been doing that um officially we're supposed to, to shoot some stuff on the 27th of this month but because of the localized lockdowns in ireland and in dublin and uh, that's not going to happen so we've changed the format of, of how it's working um, we have a trans uh, trans lady who's going to be doing a talk for us on video. We have another guy, Joseph McGuire, who is a physiognomist or a facial profiler. Um, he uses the same techniques as the FBI and the CIA to profile people based on their preferences and on their beliefs. So you can see a lot of that worn on people's faces. So Joseph's going to do a talk for us as well. I'm going to do a talk about self-acceptance and about self-image. And then we're going to photograph people individually. So I've already shot some people for it. Um, and we're going to do a book at the end of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to show people with different facial, facial differences. So with, you know, Bell's palsy, facial palsy, scars, Down syndrome, um, craniofacial prosthesis, birthmarks, pretty much anything that people have going on, we're going to photograph people over the next few months. Um, and then I'm going to feature them in a book that we're going to donate the proceeds towards charities as well. So um, that's what Project Perfect is. It's celebrating that every face is beautiful, no matter what you think you look like. That's a beautiful project. And I wish you all the luck in the world um, for that. And uh, I'm sure it is going to be the greatest, like everything you did. Um, okay, so what exactly is your, uh, now I would like to know what exactly is your success mantra. So what, 
you know, what are your uh, principles that you followed and what are those uh, mantras that you followed which led you to success? Um, a friend of mine told me a story a long time ago that he worked in a bar in Dublin, or a bar in a small town outside of Dublin called Enfield. Now, this was in the 1970s, so it's, it's a long time ago. And Ireland, we're known for our pubs. We have lots of bars, and they're very close together, and they all seem to do great business, even though there might be six or seven of them in the same street. Um, we don't drink that much in Ireland. It just looks like we do, because we've got lots of pubs. Um, but... He was working in one of the pubs, and the way people used to work in pubs and hotels back then was when you went into work in the morning really early to get ready for the day, and you'd work until maybe lunchtime, uh, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon, and then you'd go home for three or four hours, and you'd rest, and then you'd come back in and work until the place closes. But in Ireland, back then, we didn't really do that. So what we do is we work until our break time, and then we'd go to another pub and have some beer. So we'd have a few beers in the other pub, and then you go back to, the, to work afterwards. Now, it's against health and safety regulations now to go back into work for, with uh, alcohol in your system. So people don't do it anymore. But back then, it was, it was acceptable and it was okay. But he went from one pub that he worked in to a different pub, and it was really quiet. But the guy in the bar had counted the cash register four times in three hours. And my friend's boss told him, if you look after your customer, he was annoyed at the fact that the man was so greedy that he counted the money in the till four times in a, a few hours, even though there was very few people in the place. Um, so my friend's boss told him, if you look after your customers, the tills look after themselves. So the money looks after itself if you look after your customers. And I don't think his boss understood the, the profoundness of what he said, because my friend finished working there when he was a teenager. After hearing that lesson, he went off and he bought a small, sh he got a lease or he rented a small shop. Um, eventually, he bought the shop and then he turned it into a supermarket. So he kept extending the building, extending and making it bigger and bigger and bigger because he wanted, he always made sure to look after his customers because if you look after them, they will always look after you and they'll be loyal to you. Um, all based on one sentence that his boss told him when he was 16 or 17 years of age. Then when he had made a really successful business from that, he decided he was going to buy a bar in a town in the south of Ireland called Kinsale. Uh, he bought a very famous pub down there called The Bullman, which faces into the sea. And again, he brought that lesson with him. So he, the first year he had the, the bar, he'd never run a bar before, a pub before. Um, and he didn't win anything. The second year, he won the best pub in Munster, which is the state or the, the local state where that is. So he won the best pub and the best restaurant in that area um, in his second year running a bar and a restaurant. Then the third year, fourth year, fifth year and sixth year, he had the bar. He won the best pub and bar and restaurant in Ireland uh, every single year after that. And now he's running another pub in Dublin uh, called the Angler's Rest. And I remember when he took that over, he took that over and it was very, very close to failure. The owners were ready to close it and he took it over. And within a year, within eight, eight months, had made he turned over nearly 400% uh, more profit than the, the bar had been doing originally. And now it's running 26 uh, it's it's now 28 times more profitable than it was when he took it over. Week by week, week by week, it's more profitable, 28 times over than it was when he took it over. Um, and especially when it comes up to around the holiday season, Christmas and stuff like that, it gets even bigger again. And it's all based on that one sentence that his boss told him when he was 16. And when he told me that, that was before I had my own business, but I carried that lesson into my business. So if I look after my customers, everything else looks after itself. So I make sure that I look after my clients. Um, so the one thing, the big lesson that I've had or the big man is to, I, I say maybe a thousand times a week, is a version of what his boss told him. Do for the good of the village, everybody benefits. So whether it feeds directly into my business or whether they're my clients or not, I like to look after people because it will always come back to me eventually.
So it's putting good karma out there and, and knowing that it will come back. Um, and that works for me. So do for the good of the village. Everybody benefits or look after your customers. The tills look after themselves. They're really my mantra um, or the kind of things that I, I believe in. And not only that, substance over superficial as well. Always seek what's going on inside somebody because you know, it gives you a better uh, understanding of what they're wearing on the outside. So they're my kind of, they're my mantras or the, the things that my business lives <laughs> I mean, um, you know, it it sure sounded like a very small line that you should look after your customers and the money. So, but uh, it actually changed your friend's life and also it changed yours. I mean, um, that's an amazing uh, thing, you know, his boss told him and amazing. Uh, okay, so uh, lastly, a uh, message to the audiences. Uh, you're more beautiful than you think you are. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Um, that's really it. And if you don't believe me, then you can always pay me to fly to India and I'll come over and photograph you. Um, but the, I know I've been to India before. I've been to India a few times. So it's, yeah, it's really cool. Just like learn to see yourself, learn to believe and to understand that you're more beautiful than you think you are. Don't compare yourself to anybody else because like what you see in magazines and what you see on Instagram is just the highlights. It's fake. You know, it, it's not real because when you, we go onto Instagram and we see all these be beautiful pictures of beautiful places where people are, you don't realize that they have to work very hard to get to go there or, you know, that's not their normal daily life. And even if it is, I know friends who live on a beach and they don't walk on the beach because it's just the beach and the beach is there all the time. We, for, we start to lose. It's not special anymore. It just becomes standardized. They, that's a standard thing that's under their house and they don't use it. But when we go there, you know, it's, it's a big thing for us to go to the beach. It's an experience. So learning to experience ourselves like a visitor is important. Learning to see yourself like somebody else sees you is important because every face in the, in the world is beautiful. Every person in the world is beautiful. And every person in the world is cool. And every person in the world has their own joy and their own goodness to bring and their own lessons to bring. Um, and I think that's important is to learn to see yourself the way your friends and family do and the people who love you because they love you for a reason. They don't love you just because they have to. I think that's yeah. I mean, that's a very beautiful message to give to the audiences and I'm sure they must have loved the message. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. John, from, uh, for coming to the show and for coming to SQ TV. You know, I think uh, we, uh, it's about to be an hour, you know, it's actually, um, more than 50 minutes, I guess, uh, for, you know, it was supposed to be 40 minutes, but it then went for, I think, for more than 40. So I didn't even realize it, uh, uh, you know, crossing the time limit, but it was so lovely having you on the show. It was so lovely chatting with you. And thank you so much for coming to SQ TV and talking with us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And if anybody wants to check out my work, or they can go to johnmarieheadshots.com. Um, and they can always send me messages. I'm happy to, to respond to people and stuff like that as well. So johnmarieheadshots.com. Um, I'm sure it's on the bottom of the thing here anyway. But um, And that's it. Enjoy your weekend. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, that's it from SQ TV. Keep on watching.